I've just finished Men Like Gods by H.G. Wells, and I'd like to give my thoughts on it. Now, before I get into this, I'd like to give a brief summary, I'll try to keep it brief, I promise, of my history with H.G. Wells because it will inform what my background is going into this book. So as a youngster at elementary school, I read some abridged versions of H.G. Wells' book, uh, Abridged and Simplified for Children. Classics Illustrated, I believe, was the publisher, uh, which was War of the Worlds and the Time Machine. And I absolutely loved them both um, and was eager to get into more H.G. Wells. In middle school, I read The Invisible Man and um, found it a little bit of a drag, to be honest, found it a little bit slow moving and boring. And I also read In the Days of the Comet, which is one of H.G. Uh, Wells' lesser known books, but for whatever reason, it was in my local bookstore and I bought it uh, one, day, one afternoon. Now, In the Days of a Comet is a little, I'm going off of memories here, which are about 30 years old. So hopefully I'm remembering this somewhat accurately, but it, it was a little bit of a, a interesting book um, because it was, very light on plot and very heavy on message. And it was also talking a lot about socialism, which I didn't really understand a lot about uh, at that young age. Um, and that somewhat put me off of H.G. Wells. I, I came away from th that experience believing that the abridged, simplified versions of his work were great, um, but his actual unabridged works were, were not um, for me. Uh, I've since then stayed away from H.G. Wells for a long time. I did read The Island of Dr. Monroe in college. Monroe, Moreau, right? The Island of Dr. Monroe. It was right about the time the movie came out and there was all the hype around it. And I, I did enjoy that, but uh, never really came back uh, until uh, about 10 years ago in, in my late 30s, I finally read the original Time Machine and the original War of the Worlds and loved them. Uh, Time Machine especially, e even though I already knew the story because I had read the abridged version when I was younger, I, I just was in awe of the way the, the mystery and the suspense was just slowly partialed out. It was, it was a short book, but a brilliant book. War of the Worlds, a little bit lesser so. Um, the, the, the prose was easy enough to read, but I, I found the the plot was a little bit plotting as just kind of the just the continuing onslaught of the Martians who just can't be stopped by anything. But it, it was all right. Uh, then I left Wells alone for a few years. But last year for Halloween, I read The Invisible Man, which I found in the bookstore here in Vietnam. Now, I had already read this once before in seventh grade. And like I said before, I didn't really care for it. But upon rereading it. I loved it. Um, the, the, the prose style here is um, maybe a little bit too sophisticated for a seventh grader. It's uh, Victorian era prose. But uh, as an adult, uh, I, I can fully appreciate all the humor in the book, all the little dramatic turns, all the changes in tone, which H.G. Wells pulls off masterfully. Uh, I, I really loved rereading this book, and it made me think... I need to read some more H.G. Wells. Um, now, uh, I'm living out here in Vietnam, so the selection is limited, but my local bookstore here in Vietnam did have Men Like God, so I snatched it up. I snatched it up about a year ago, and I'm just getting around to it now because I've been distracted by other reading projects, but I uh, finally got around to it. And, um, yeah, this book it was published in 1923, and it's one of Wells' utopian books, of which apparently near the end of his life, he wrote a lot. Now, I mentioned in the, in, sorry, in the Days of the Comet earlier, uh, and that was sort of a utopian book as well, though that was published in 1906. So I think that was a little bit early, although I don't really know enough about Wells' whole work uh, body of work to say. But certainly, apparently, by the 1920s, he was just writing a lot of utopian books. Uh, all his critics say so. Wikipedia says so. Uh, in fact, there's an interesting quote by Wikipedia, by G.K. Chesterton, who I believe was one of Wells's critics. 
He says, uh, Mr. Wells is a born storyteller who has sold his birthright for a pot of message. So that's, that's an, an allusion to the biblical story of Esau and Jacob selling the birthright for a pot of stew. Uh, here, Wells is selling his birthright as a storyteller for a pot of message. Um, the, the implication being that Wells' true talents is writing interesting stories, but he squandered his true talents because he wants to moralize and be a messenger. And, and Wells was uh, uh, into a lot of causes. I, I believe he was a socialist, although the, this book uh, is distancing itself a little bit from socialism. Concerned about war and militarism and uh, religion, um, that is anti-religion. Wells was an atheist. Um, so this book, written during that period, I think can arguably fall within that uh, within that quip. This is maybe an example of Mr. Wells selling his storytelling birthright for a pot of message. It's a lot of message in this book, and it's a little bit light on story. Which, which makes me kind of wonder, of all the H.G. Wells books out there, why, why was this one on the bookshelves in Vietnam? I, I don't know, but for whatever reason it was. Actually, I, I take that back. Maybe I do know a little bit. Of Wells' utopian books, uh, of which apparently the quality may have varied somewhat, uh, though again, I, I've not read them all, um, this is apparently one of the more famous ones, and, and maybe one of the better ones. And in fact, uh, this one has a little bit of a mark on world literature, because uh, this was the inspiration for uh, L. Aldous Huxley to write A Brave New World. Uh, now I've got a confession to make. I haven't actually read Brave New World, so someday I'm gonna have to read that and then I'll come back and maybe talk about how these two books compare. But uh, I'm familiar with it by reputation um, and Brave New World was written as a rebuttal against this book. So I guess this is uh, Wells's vision of Utopia and Brave New World is arguing against that vision of Utopia. So I, I'm going to get into spoilers here because there's not much of a plot in this book, but what plot there is, I'm, I'm going to talk about. Um, but before I get into the spoilers, maybe I'll, I'll give a, my summation, um, just in, in case anyone wants to turn it off before the spoilers and wants to know whether or not it's a recommend. Um, the plot is interesting at points. It, it, it can drag at points when we're in uh, the message part of the book. But when the plot does come back, it can be interesting. Uh, I, I, I wish there was more of a plot, but what bit of a plot there was could be interesting at times. The, the book is a utopian book, and I know it's fashionable to scoff at utopian books. Um, utopian meaning it's, it's a place that's imagining a utopian society. Uh, and it's fashionable to scoff at them and say, oh, th that would never work, D disregarding human nature. Um, but I think it is an interesting intellectual exercise to uh, try and push what are the limits of human nature and what forms of society may be possible, at least in the author's imagination. And then there can be an interesting back and forth between the brain of the author in the brain of the reader, as they try and sort out exactly what is possible, what not is po what is not possible, to what degree is is it possible, and I'm in this review. I'm largely going to try to avoid getting caught in the weeds, partly because there's a lot in here to respond to, and partly because I'm not sure I really have anything intelligent to say about a lot of it. Um, there were certain parts uh, where I thought. Wells actually had some good points. Uh, there were certain parts where I thought he had some bad points. There are certain parts I'm still deciding on. And there are some interesting points uh, on here where what Wells was projecting as a far off future utopia um, has actually come to pass in the last hundred years since this book was published. And this was 
first published in 1922 or 1923. So, uh, you know, um, I, I seem to have conflicting dates here. Um, but uh, about 100 years, exactly, at this point, give or take a couple of years. Um, so so the, the example of something that has come to pass is the uh, freeness with which we are able to communicate with anyone all over the world to send video messages or audio messages, the way information is accessible now, uh, anywhere, anytime. Uh, that that was one of the uh, forecasts of this utopia, which which we have pulled off. Now, I, I mean, I know, I know, the, the internet is a curse as much as it is a blessing, but it's, it's just interesting. One example of something which uh, was, you know, completely unimaginable maybe a hundred years ago and people would say, ah, humans would never pull that off or something. Uh, you know, it, it does make you think about how you, you, you do kind of get locked into thinking the way it is now is the way it has to be, right? But, but human society has undergone massive reorganizations over the past couple millennia. I, I'm sure in the feudal era, people thought there could never ever be any sort of social organization except feudalism. That's just the way human nature is designed. Um, so it, it's, it's, worth, it's worth the intellectual experiment, I think. And, and to that extent, I think this book is worth engaging with, maybe even if I don't always agree with it. Okay, let's get into spoilers then. Um, let, let me talk about the plot, um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to spoil stuff, but the there's a uh, aging, middle-aged character in this book, Mr. Barnstaple, all the characters have rather interesting, maybe obvious names. Almost all the characters. Um, the the first few pages of the book I uh, identified with. Uh, I'm middle aged myself. Um, I because I've started my family late. I've got young children, not not teenage boys like this character does. But the 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 sense. Uh, of tiredness, maybe that you feel in middle age, the the depression about all the bad news from the world that's always happening, uh, and um, the the just general pessimism of the world, which is an interesting reminder. I guess it was true a hundred years ago, just as it was today. Now I. At, at least that seems to be the perception of it. Now, uh, you know, the, the impending climate disaster maybe is unique to our times, or maybe it's not. I mean, I, I know it's unique in the sense that there was no climate disaster back in 1923, but but um, maybe with the League of Nations falling apart and the Bolshevik Revolution and the big famine in Russia uh, and, and the coal strike and the Depression, all, all of which are in the first few pages of this book, it, it must have felt to them that their world was falling apart just as much as ours was. And, that, and that's actually an interesting little point, which is uh, the, the beginning of this book uh, is um, very contemporaneous. It, it is referencing stuff that's uh, grabbed right from the headlines of the time. So if you know a little bit of history, maybe you, you'd appreciate those little details uh, as you read this. If you don't know history, then, then don't worry about it. You can still enjoy the book. <clears throat> The character, Mr. Barnstaple, is taking a vacation uh, away from his family. And while he is motoring around the uh, road, he gets sucked in to a parallel universe uh, with a bunch of prominent um, English statesmen. So uh, the, the, just because their cars are in the same area at the same time, they, they get sucked into this parallel universe. Uh, and this opens up maybe one of the interesting parts of the plot is uh, the disconnect between Barnstaple and the people he gets sucked in with. So Barnstaple is just an ordinary guy. He's an intellectual. He works at one of the liberal uh, newspapers. Uh, but he gets sucked in with all these celebrities. Um, uh, and uh, according to Wikipedia, the, the people 
he gets sucked into are uh, recognizable English politicians or celebrities at the time. And uh, Wikipedia identifies one of them. Rupert Catskill in this book is Winston Churchill. Now, I, I actually consulted Wikipedia when I was about halfway through this book. I, I avoided, I avoided, you, you know, Wikipedia, you've got the plot section, right? I avoided that. I scrolled down to like the, some of the literary analysis and I, I saw that Rupert Catskill is made to represent Winston Churchill. And once I clued into that, uh, elements of the book made a lot more sense. I was a little bit confused about what Rupert Catskill was supposed to be doing in this book. But once I, I realized he was a Winston Churchill cipher, uh, then uh, it just kind of all falls into place. Because in this group, uh, we have uh, reactionary elements. Uh, there, there's Father Amerton, who's... Uh, the archbishop of some place or another, or a, a, a clergy of some sort. I might be getting the details wrong. There's Mr. Um, Burleffs. I hope I'm remembering the names right. Who's uh, described as a, a conservative statesman. Uh, but uh, despite that moniker conservative, he's actually one of the more open-minded characters of the book. Uh, and they, they react against this uh, new utopia with, with kind of typical uh, reactionary um, horror at it. But uh, Rupert Catskill seems to be a bit of a wild card, at least at the beginning. Uh, and then when, once you realize he's identified with Winston Churchill and Winston Churchill's unique dynamic personality, then it makes sense. So uh, Winston Churchill, as I guess you, you may know, uh, is identified nowadays as the uh, uh, patron of the conservative movement, but actually started off life as a liberal and had a number of adventures. I believe he was captured in the Boer War and then escaped again. Uh, and it was in the uh, Sudan War. Um, <clears throat> in his younger life, he, he was very adventurous. And that's alluded to in this book. He, he's, he's got a roving intellect and, and an adventurous uh, personality. Um, which is going to cause trouble later on in the plot. Uh, interestingly enough, again, according to Wikipedia, Wells, H.G. Uh, Wells and Winston Churchill had an interesting history. They were at one time friends and uh, fellow ideologues, uh, very much closely aligned. Uh, their politics be was beginning to separate by this point in history, but they were still apparently somewhat... Uh, Respectful, respectful of each other, each other or ad, admirers of each other. The Rupert Catskill in this book does some pretty dodgy things, but uh, you, you still kind of admire his pluck a bit, um, even at the end of the book. So, uh, yes, they, they are uh, sucked into uh, a parallel universe where it turns out there's this utopia uh, with a society that's 3,000 years um, in the future uh, and has uh, is roughly parallel to Earth. But over the past 3,000 years, they've been able to create uh, a utopia and, and get rid of the bad things. And a lot of this book uh, is them explaining their utopia to the Earthlings. Uh, and how their society was once like the Earthmen, but they were eventually able to um, refine all of the bad elements out of it. Uh, and then some, some parts of the Earthmen de um, debating them uh, and arguing with them. But there, there's a lot of, this is where the message comes in. There's a lot of talking about this utopia. The plot comes back into life a little bit when it turns out there's another party of Earthmen who also got sucked into this parallel universe. And this other party of Earthmen is less scrupulous. Uh, there's uh, some sort of uh, baron who's driving a car way too fast and ends up running over and killing one of the Utopians uh, and just has a very reckless and callous attitude towards life. Uh, and the Earthlings who are already in Utopia are a little bit horrified when they find out that this new group has joined and they're not quite sure now how the utopians are going to react to it. 
It's an interesting setup, um, but to my mind, it doesn't really go anywhere because the, the new Earthlings who join the gang of Earthlings already in Utopia quickly take in subservient positions. So that, that Baron who is ruthless with his car and didn't seem to care about human life, uh, he doesn't take over. Instead, he, like everybody else, becomes subservient to Rupert Catskill, Catskill the Winston Churchill cipher, and uh, his big ideas. So, uh, the, the, you know, the, such a big deal is made of these guys coming in. You're like, oh, what trouble are they going to cause? But it, it, it turns out very little. It's, it's the characters who are already there. The Winston Churchill cipher, uh, foremost among them, who's going to cause the trouble. Uh, then, then we get into the part where the plot really kicks off and where uh, this makes very interesting reading. And I, maybe I should put this in perspective by saying, before we got to that point, I was, I don't know, 160 pages in maybe or something. Uh, and I was beginning to wonder if I was interested enough in this book to finish it, or at least to finish it quickly. This looked like it might be one of those books that just lingered on my bookshelf and I slowly nibbled away at because I was just losing the motivation to keep turning the pages as it was more and more description of this utopia. But then the plot kicks in and the plot, to give Wells credit, I think he, he does write an interesting plot. Uh, Rupert Catskill, uh, well, first of all, there's a plague that breaks out because the Earthlings have brought in viruses uh, to this utopia that the utopians are not equipped to handle. Um, <clears throat> this, of course, is H.G. Wells recycling this point from War of the Worlds. And who knows how many other times he's used this point. I don't know. Like, like I said, I've only read a handful of his books, but, but definitely recognizable, at least with War of the Worlds. Um, okay, so we're doing this, uh, the, the virus is affecting the aliens again. Oh, okay. Uh, so the, the Earthlings are put into quarantine, but some of the Utopians are still visiting them to make sure that they have everything that they, they need and to give them medicine, etc. The Winston Churchill cipher, Rupert Catskill, gets it into his head that they are going to rebel and they are going to launch a takeover of Utopia. Uh, even though the Utopians are much more in advance of them, uh, Rupert Catskill believes that uh, all this peace has made them soft. Uh, he believes passionately, maybe as Winston Churchill would believe, that in order to thrive, you need to struggle. You, you need wars, you need competition. It, it was, it's what gives humanity its edge. And these utopians, not having, having had uh, 3,000 years of peace and prosperity and no struggle, uh, will be easy to take over and this little earth um, colony can take over all of utopia. Uh, Barnstaple is the only dissenter among them. So they argue Barnstaple fails to convince anyone. He is outclassed because uh, he's just a normal guy and he doesn't know how to give speeches. And he's, he's in this colony with all these great British statesmen who like do nothing all day but give speeches and this is their life. And he, he just can't argue with them. They, they will out, out argue him. So he's watching horrified as they're making these plans to uh, take captive uh, the utopians when the utopians come to check up on him, on, on them. He, he uh, at the last minute, he just panics and shouts out a warning to the Utopians, uh, which uh, ends up botching the plan to capture the Utopians, although a couple of pistols go off and uh, a couple of the Utopians are killed or wounded. Uh, and then the Utopians fly away. And then all of a sudden there's Barnstaple, who's a traitor, who is being regarded as a traitor to the rest of the Earthlings. Uh, so now he's got to run away from them. Um, Rupert Catskill uh, actually wants Barnstable to escape because he realizes with Churchill's cunning that now that events have gotten to this point, um, 
Barnstable is going to be more valuable as somebody who could escape and be a liaison to the utopians than he would be uh, as executed as a traitor. But the rest of them don't see it that way. So, so uh, Rupert Catskill is able to uh, give uh, a delay uh, where he, he convenes a trial uh, for Barnstable. During this time, Barnstable, they're, they're in quarantine up on this castle. I forgot to mention that. But Barnstable tries to escape uh, and, and gets um, trapped uh, scaling down the rock when he, he gets to a point where he can't really get any further. Uh, and all, all of this, all of this is interesting. Uh, and it's a reminder that when Wells wants to be, he, he can put in an interesting plot. Uh, and then it gets resolved and we're a little bit back to the descriptions of Utopia. Now, um, I, I know I'm sending mixed messages here because I, I've been saying that on the one hand, all this preaching is very boring. On the other hand, I think it's a useful intellectual exercise. But, you, you know, it, sometimes some in useful intellectual exercises can be a bit boring. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if I had a more curious mind or if I was a, a more uh, inquisitive reader, um, m maybe I would have enjoyed those parts more. But l l let's talk about the utopia here. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, wh where to begin? Th there's a lot in here. Uh, so th the first thing to note that was interesting to me is H.G. Uh, Wells, or uh, is is H.G. Wells is well aware of evolutionary psychology, uh, and this uh, maybe surprised me a little bit because I, I tend to think evolutionary psychology is something that's relatively recent. But maybe that's just reflecting my own biases. Maybe just because I discovered it relatively late in life, uh, I tend to think it, it wasn't around before. But um, I. Evolutionary psychology, ever since I read The Moral Animal a few years ago, and I'll link in my description to my review of that, it is something that uh, really weighs on my mind a lot. You know, why do we humans do all these stupid, cruel, crazy, irrational things that we do? Be because it's been bred up into us uh, from our, like, our caveman days and, and the competition for food on the savanna and on all that kind of stuff. And Wells understands that. He... he, he does not, or at least he claims not to have uh, a um, an overly optimistic view of humanity or a whitewashed view of humanity. Maybe he does have an overly optimistic view of humanity, but at, at least he, he claims to know where humans are starting from. Um, but what he believes is, well, it's a few things really. Uh, one thing is uh, he believes that over time, humans can perfect themselves by building better and better systems in which they live in. He is, uh, I don't know what his entire intellectual history is, uh, but certainly at this point, he is anti-revolution. So he's seen the revolution in Russia. He's writing this book at the time of the Great Famine in Russia. Uh, he, he knows that it's been a, a brutal affair. Uh, and he believes that there's no great revolution is going to change humanity. What is needed for change is uh, just people individually deciding to be better. Uh, and as those individual choices get made, uh, they'll encourage other people to make individual choices and gradually, very gradually, systems will get changed. Uh, it, it's a slow evolution view of a socialist utopia. Um, so if, if you're at all familiar with uh, socialist debates, th there's always this revolution versus evolution debate. They're doing a violent revolution to overthrow the capitalist system, or can we slowly reform the system from within? Uh, Wells, Wells seems to be, um, I'm not sure if it's fair to call him a socialist at this point. He seems to be distancing himself from the word socialism in this book, but it, it, it's some sort of socialist-esque utopia that he's envisioned here, which, which he thinks we can slowly reach. Uh, and um, 
Yeah, I don't know. It, it got me thinking. I mean, certainly, when, when you look at the state of humanity now, you just get really depressed, don't you? But could we make it better by, you know, by individually making better choices, uh, getting off Twitter, not wasting time playing video games, uh, breaking our internet addiction, getting back into community service, building organizations. Is, is there hope for reform here? Um, now, let, let me back up maybe and, and say something which I, I should have said at the beginning of this, which is I think when, whenever you're dealing with a utopian book, there are a couple of different questions you want to be asking. Um, one is, is the utopia that the author is presenting possible, g given the limitations of human nature. But two, is it desirable? So it, it could be argued, it could be that uh, you don't even want to get to the is it possible question because they're arguing for a, a system which isn't even desirable. Uh, and there are, there are points in this book where I think you've, you've got to wonder if it's desirable. So the, the first thing is, uh, when they're in this utopian world, they make such a big deal about how underpopulated it is compared to Earth. So uh, there's all this countryside, and you've got a few people in the countryside, but it's mostly just kind of big fields with just maybe one or two people in it. And as they're uh, traveling through this utopia on the high-speed cars and on the airplanes and looking down and seeing everything, they, they, they note just how very sparsely populated the country is, how very sparsely populated the towns are. Uh, and it comes out uh, fairly early in the book that this is by design. There is population control that has been going on uh, in this book to deliberately keep the population down uh, so that uh, the earth is more beautiful uh, and it's more enjoyable for the, the people who reside there. Now, the priest that they have with them, or the archbishop, I don't remember, uh, is horrified by this uh, and gives a big rant about how uh, this is against the plan of God. Um, but the, the utopians argue back. I mean, they, they say, well, you just, you just told us about this big famine that was going on in Russia in your world where you didn't have enough food to feed everybody. I don't know, I, uh, uh, or possibly it was a distribution problem with the famine in, in Russia. But, um, but uh, yeah, the, the, the book takes the, the, the argument that there just wasn't enough food to feed everybody. Um, and so they, they say, why, why do you think it's a virtue to allow, uh, allow all these children to be born just so that they can later star starve during their lifetime? So an, an interesting point, um, but of course it reminded me of this book, which I reviewed a few years ago on this channel. I'll link to my review down below, and which I still have on my bookshelf, The Intellectuals in the Masses by John Kerry. So uh, this book uh, is about uh, the intellectuals and the literary class from 1880 to 1939. And in it, John Keary argues that there's a big population explosion going on in Europe at the time. Now, of course, compared to the population uh, now in 2024, uh, it, it's, it's nothing, right? Like we've, we've, we've since doubled or tripled the world's population since then. But it, it was a big population expansion for the people who were living there. Uh, and uh, the, um, 
as the 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 towns were rapidly expanding and the countryside was just disappearing under all these expanding towns and suburbs there was a real fear uh in england and well, well let's say england uh that the, the beauty of the english countryside was just getting completely lost by this population explosion and that it was turning out this mass of humanity which was just getting a little bit lost in these dark, dirty cities in which they were toiling. Um, and since I've read this book, uh, it's interesting. I've read a number of English authors who's uh, um, written exactly about that subject. So I've, I've had the opportunity to refer back to this book many a time. So uh, Lady Shatterley's Lover by D.H. Lawrence, uh, which I read after I read this book is a perfect example of that. Spends so much time talking about the English countryside and how it's being lost. Uh, Coming Up for Air by George Orwell, which again, I read after I read this book, is a perfect example of this. And uh, yeah, here we go, uh, Men Like Gods, a- another perfect example of something written in this time frame of an English author very concerned about the population explosion and how that can get under control. And in fact, uh, there are two chapters in this book dedicated to H.G. Wells. So chapter six, H.G. Wells on getting rid of people. And uh, number seven, H.G. Wells against H.G. Wells. Now, I went back to the index here because it's been a few years since I read this book. Uh, and I was uh, looking to see if Men Like Gods was actually mentioned in this book. And uh, not by name. Uh, he goes through a lot of other of H.G. Wells' works. But um, yeah, Men Like Gods is, is not one of the books he mentions in here. Um, but uh, obviously very much in line with um, Wells' other uh, writings and the, the concern of, of John Kerry here. Now, in, in this book, The Intellectuals and the Masses, John Kerry makes the case that this concern about the overpopulation that was common among the literati and the intellectuals in England at the time was headed to dark places. And he draws a line between this uh, movement to control population to eugenics and then all the way to, you guessed it, Adolf Hitler. Uh, and the Nazis, who, who uh, John Kerry is, is, is saying um, was influenced by this intellectual culture with, with the Nazis' um, uh, uh, emphasis on eugenics. So uh, this book, when, when, when you read it, I, I, I mean, on the one hand, on the one hand, I had conflicting feelings about John Kerry's thesis when I read this book, because I think sometimes you do have to be concerned about a population crisis. Now, with the full benefit of hindsight, we can identify that uh, the Earth is capable of sustaining a lot more people than they thought in the 1920s. Uh, But at some point, at some point, You've, you've got to be concerned about it, right? Uh, and um, But can you have that without going to eugenics and without going to racism or without going to eugenics at least? Maybe, arguably, I don't know, but, but H.G. Wells goes straight to eugenics. Uh, and in fact, he doesn't even beat around the bush. Uh, let, let me... So on page 62, he, he's talking about how the, the, the people who are born in utopia are um, selected to be born of healthy parents. And I thought, ooh, that sounds a little bit like eugenics. But then we get to page 75, where Wells himself uses the word eugenics. 
So the utopians told of eugenic beginnings, of a new and sure decision in the choice of parents, of an increasing certainty in the science of heredity. So uh, th th there's, there's no debate about whether we're headed to eugenics or not. He's actually just saying eugenics. He, he's using that word. Uh, okay, but, but does it lead to racism? Well, uh, on page 209, uh, then we get, um, on Utopia, as on Earth, there had been dusky and brown peoples, and they remained distinct. The various races mingled socially, but did not interbreed very much. Rather, they purified and intensified their racial gifts and beauties. There was often very passionate love between people of contrasted race, but rarely did such love come to procreation. There had been a certain deliberate elimination of ugly, malignant, narrow, stupid, gloomy types. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting into a, a different part of the eugenics here. Um, now, to be perfectly fair to Wells, uh, I, again, I don't know if I researched his whole life what rocks I would turn up. Is that the metaphor? What what what, what I I would turn under rocks? I, I I don't know what skeletons I would find in his closet if I researched his whole life. Um, but certainly the the context you get from this particular book uh, is that Wells believes in separate but equal. He doesn't seem to believe that the colored races are inferior. In fact, elsewhere in this book. He seems to be sympathetic to the, the, the plight of black people uh, in history. Um, but he, he doesn't want the mixing because that's going to mess up the purity of the races, each race's own unique beauty. So I, it, I, I get the feeling H.G. Wells is a separate but equal type guy. But um, there you go, huh? Uh, that, that's, that's one element of this utopia that I'm not so sure about. And there are, I don't know how much time I just wasted dissecting that little bit about the population control. What, what was I, what was that 12 minutes I was blabbing on about that? That, that that's just one element of this. Now, now that, that happens to be rather low hanging fruit. That, that's something I, I can uh, unequivocally give my thoughts on without having to think too much about it. There, there are other things in here that um, maybe are gonna require a little bit more thought from me before I can uh, dissect whether I'm actually for or against it. Uh, and to be quite honest, I haven't put in that thought yet. I, I was reading this book casually. I was turning the pages. I was occasionally pondering mm, this or that, but I, I wasn't really giving this book the full intellectual energy it would deserve in order to make a, a, a full analysis of uh, Wells's utopia. And maybe I should have, maybe I should read it again, maybe I should mark it for a reread. I, I, um, I picked up on BookTube. Who did I pick this up from? Uh, Jared Henderson's channel, is that the name of it? Uh, he was remarking with philosophical books uh, it's good to read them twice. Uh, the, the first time, just read them through to get the broad outlines of the argument, and you can read it through casually. And then the second time, you kind of read through and you analyze it more carefully. So may, maybe that would be the way to approach this book, or maybe I'm just making excuses for myself. Uh, I don't know. But uh, I, I, think, I think at least for me, uh, I need to read it a couple times before I was really prepared to dissect this utopia, but uh, a man who did see, spend this, uh, sorry, a man who did seem to spend a lot of time thinking about it was uh, Atlas Huxley, who wrote a rebuttal to this called "Brave New World." So maybe that would be worth checking out. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find that book in Vietnam, but I'm definitely going to keep my eyes open for it next. Whew. Okay. I'm, I'm going to call it good here. Uh, thank you very much, BookTube.